All right. So uh, welcome back to the Fortran users of NERSC office hours. Uh, last month's went pretty well. So uh, we're probably going to go ahead and do these on a monthly basis going forward um, just to kind of you know touch base and see see what everybody's up to see if uh, there's specific top topics that we'd like to cover discussions we'd like to have those kinds of things uh, for today's agenda uh, I'm gonna do like a half an hour presentation on like introduction to templates that will be coming up in like the 2028 standard uh, I've been on the subcommittee that's that's been developing the idea um, and we've got we've gotten far enough along and have syntax uh, far enough along that we can kind of start, you know, presenting these things and, and demonstrating what things are going to look like. Um, and then uh, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about, I want to put together uh, kind of a day or two training session. I want to talk about logistics, you know, in-person or virtual or hybrid or, or, you know, timing, exactly that kind of stuff. And then uh, Manuel is going to give us a little bit of a presentation on Cody. He, he did a uh, training session, was that last week? Yes. Uh, yeah, last week uh, on using that tool for Fortran code. Uh, that was pretty interesting. So we thought he thought we'd let him uh, kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started with uh, presentation on templates. Share screen, desktop. All right, can everybody see the slides? Yes. 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 All right. Perfect. All right, so Fortran templates, a primer. So I'm not going to start going into like complicated use cases or, uh, you know, lots of the details about how exactly some of these things work, but I just kind of want to give you a flavor for what are they going to look like? What are some of the capabilities and those kinds of ideas with just a kind of a simple example. So uh, we had a couple of design goals in mind when we started working on the idea for of templates for Fortran. Uh, like number one thing that we wanted was we want the compiler to ensure that the template is valid for all valid template parameters. When you instantiate a when, when you write a template, the compiler ought to be able to check a lot about whether that template is going to be valid when it gets instantiated. And then a lot of uh, kind of ahead of time checking of the parameters when it's instantiated. So you can kind of give you better error messages than uh, C++ is infamous for. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that when you wrote a template, there wasn't some aspect of it that like prevented it from working with derived types or prevented it from working with intrinsic types. We didn't want to end up like with this bifurcation of people having to, well, I wrote this template to work with reals and integers, but now that means that people can't use their own derived types for it. Uh, and vice versa. We also don't want the template to dictate spelling of names of procedures and types and constants and things like that. We, the, I should be able to use a template that wasn't designed with my use case in mind, or, or I should be able to use two templates together, even if they weren't designed together, like if they happen to spell things differently, that shouldn't prevent me from using one with the other and vice versa. So those are the kind of like the design goals for templates. So uh, just kind of demonstrate a little bit of some example syntax here. Uh, so we've got a few new keywords that come into the going to come into the language and a couple a couple of new statements and a couple of new uh, constructs. So. The first one is a requirement block. The idea here is there's no executable code in here, but it's going to define what which arguments are types and which arguments are procedures and which arguments are constants. Uh, this example doesn't have constants, but that's one other aspect. Uh, 
And so it's just going to define the interfaces to the procedures and then which other arguments are types and constants. And so you can define some procedure template arguments in terms of the type arguments, et cetera. Uh, and, then, and then that is kind of a, a concept that can be reused in other templates. This one's just kind of a nonsense example just to demonstrate syntax, but, but you kind of get the idea. It, it ends up looking similar-ish to an interface block. And so when you define the interface to the procedures, you don't need to repeat the interface and interface block here because it kind of is already implied. Then a template takes parameters. Uh, I think we the the syntax terms that we've kind of settled on are going to be that these are deferred arguments. And then on the instantiation side, those are the instantiation arguments. And so that's that's the analog to for procedures them being dummy arguments and actual arguments. So those are the terms that the standard defines when when you're defining and calling a procedure. So for templates, when you're defining a template, you've got deferred arguments. When you're instantiating a template, you've got actual or uh, instantiation arguments. Uh, you can use the requires keyword to say these arguments take their kind and interface information from that requirement block. So it's effectively kind of a copy paste of like this information. That way I don't have to repeat it, right? Because that's a pattern that we'll see kind of happens on a re pretty regular basis where these things are going to have common, are going to be very common, like certain interfaces and types will be very common. And then all templates must be explicitly instantiated. So there's a new instantiate, there's a new statement called instantiate, and it's similar-ish to a use statement. Like I want to use a module, I want to instantiate a template, but I can be explicit about the things I want to bring into scope from whatever is defined in that template, and I can rename those things too. So exactly the way you can do it on a use statement. You can get you can get the only clause and you can do a renaming on on import. OK, so next let's look at a motivating example. So this is a relatively simple procedure. It's probably something you wouldn't necessarily even write a procedure for. But this gives us kind of uh, something simple to use as a motivating example. So we've got a. A simple subroutine, we're going to do AX plus Y, which is standard uh, operation that happens in lots of codes, where I want to increment uh, an array with uh, some scalar times another array and do an increment. Right. So, so if we're going to define this procedure, it's going to take a real A, a real array X, and a real array y, and it's going to increment y by a times x. We can do this in a single line with array statements. Um, but what happens when now we want this to work with double precision 2? In standard Fortran for its entire history, you have to repeat the procedure in Oh, I have to remember when the generic interfaces came into the language. I think maybe 95. Damien, do you remember off the top of your head? Uh, I'm sorry, I got distracted. What's the question? <laughs> uh, when, when did generic interfaces come into the language? Oh, 1990. 90. Okay. So so as of 90, you could at least put put those behind the same interface, right? I could I can have two different procedures. One takes reels and one takes double precision. They'll have different names, but I can put them behind the same name. So I can, it, from the outside, it looks like I have one procedure that can take reals or doubles. But I still had to repeat those procedures and write the code twice. Templates are going to let us fix that. So the, the simplest extension is I want to be able to handle different kinds of real. So I'm going to take 
the subroutine I had, and I'm going to put it in the template. And we're going to make the template have an integer constant argument that is the kind of real that we want that procedure to work on. Okay. So what happens is we, we define a template. It has one, one deferred argument. We declare that that argument is an integer constant. So this is a new keyword as well. And that says that whatever, when on the instantiate statement, that value has to be an integer, has to be kind of a kind integer, or the value has to be an integer of default kind, and it has to be a constant. And then we can use that value as the kind parameter for the reals in the definition of our subroutine. And we're going to use that uh, generic interface feature from Fortran 90 to add when that gets instantiated. This procedure will exist, and we'll, but but we've left it private in the template. But we'll go ahead and put it into a generic interface that we make public, which means outside of the template, uh, I can define the couple of kind parameters, single precision and double precision. I can instantiate that template with both kind parameters. And then I can define, you know, A, X, and Y with single precision and DA, DX, DY with double precision. And then I can call that AXPY procedure with either, either set of arguments. And so this kind of, this lets us not have to repeat the code that wants to work on different kinds, right? So that was like the simplest extension to get us for, uh, to be, not have to repeat code and still be able to reuse it. The next extension is, well, it, it could work for integers too. So the next extension is we're gonna extend on the we're going to make the type a template parameter. However, the, the definition of templates that we've come up with is you are not allowed to use any procedure or operation inside of a template that doesn't have an explicit interface, which means I don't have a procedure that works on, oh, shoot, uh, you know what? Uh, I need to fix that. That should be type T. Let's fix that real quick. All right, then go back. All right, so I don't have, there, there are no intrinsic procedures. There are no external procedures that operate on type T, Me meaning I have to pass in the procedures that I want to use for plus and times to the template. And I have to tell the template what their interface is. In this case, because plus and times will have the same interface, I'd like to not have to repeat it. And so that's where these requirement blocks come in. Uh, I can define a requirement binary operator. It takes a type and a procedure. I want that to be an elemental function that takes two arguments and returns a value of the same type. Right? So, those, so all three of those things are the same type. Then I can use that requirement to say that plus has to be a binary operator on T and times has to be a binary operator on T. And then down in my procedure, I can use those, those template arguments as the procedures for plus and times in my actual implement in my in my procedure. Then I can instantiate uh, my template three different ways now, two different kinds of real and integers. And I can call it those three different ways, two different kinds of real and integers. There's another little trick here is we've said that it can do generic resolution 
on instantiation. So when I say operator plus, it looks into the template and says, the interface required for this procedure is such that I know which specific procedure I'm supposed to pick out of operator plus, because operator plus is a generic interface. But, we, but we're allowing generic resolution to happen on instantiation. So it's going to pick the one that works for reals. And then it's going to pick the one that works for double precision. And it's going to pick the one that works for integer. That way you don't have to unwrap generic interfaces in order to be able to instantiate a template in a specific way. Next. Um, Fortran lets us do operations between different types, actually. So what happens if I've got an A that's a real, X is an integer, and Y is double precision? Right? I could I could have written the original expression, A or Y equals Y plus A times X. I could have written that in line, but now I can't hide it behind a procedure. Well, why not? So let's expand our template a little further, make it more generic so that it's got three type arguments and two procedure arguments. We need to expand our requirement here to take the three different type arguments so we can have an operator that takes potentially two different types and returns a potentially even different type. In this case, we're going to say that plus needs to take types u and v. Or uh, yeah, now, now the argument matching starts to get a little a little convoluted. Uh, it takes a v and a u and returns a v, and that's that's the interface for our plus. The interface for times takes a t and a u and returns a u, and so that a is type t and x is type u. So when we do times, it gives us back a u. And then our plus takes a v, so y is a v, and returns, or it takes a v and a u and returns a v so that it can do the assignment back to y. And we can still go ahead and put that behind a generic interface. And in this case, so now I've got, you know, uh, a, there, I'm not showing all the different ways that I could instantiate and call this, but you get the idea. Now I can mix and match the types. And so now I can do AX plus Y with different numeric kinds. And I can still, uh, I can still do generic resolution and, and get matches here because uh, operator plus, it says it's going to have to take a real and an integer and return a real. Well, operator plus, if one of the arguments is real and the other is integer, it returns the real of that kind. And then operator star, it's going to look and say, I can still do generic resolution because I need to take a real and a double precision, or a double precision and a real, and return uh, a real or a double precision. and the, the operator does that, right? So the operators still work out such that it can do generic resolution. So that is kind of like the simple example motivating, you know, some ways that you might want to be able to use templates and some of their basic features and how, you, how they're going to work when they come into standard in 2028-ish. So questions. Does anybody have questions? I, got, I have a question. Can uh -huh. jump in. Uh, yep. You know, your, your last example there, um, uh -huh. it, it seems like it requires a lot of knowledge on how those uh, binary operators work under the hood, right? Like I could imagine the multiplication operator uh, in some scenario might, if you multiply two, two numbers of mixed precision result, resort to giving an answer in the higher precision number and then downcast that based off of the assignment operator. Um, 
you know, but but you really have to know what those are doing under the hood. Is that right? Or is that the right way um, to do not really. Um, so long as the interface matches. All right. So so assi the assignment uh, is only supported for like types. It's only supported for like types. Okay. So we we only support. It says, well, the the way we've worded it is any in instantiation arguments. The type has to support intrinsic assignment. So we can always assume in intrinsic assignment is available for a given type inside the template. However, right, so so that means that if plus here didn't return type V, I couldn't do the assignment. I see, I see. Right, so we're making sure that all of the interfaces and operations match up so that the expressions are still kind of type safe without knowing the actual type. I don't know the actual types that will happen, but I know what all of the procedure interfaces look like. So I can kind of do the type checking in the abstract sense and then know that when I'm going to do an assignment, I know the thing on the right-hand side is the appropriate type that I can do an intrinsic assignment. So that you, you won't be able to take advantage of that. I can do assignment from real to double precision and the type casting happens. Because you don't know that the types necessarily will be real and double precision. And so you'll get, a, you'll get an error in when it tries to compile the template before you ever try and instantiate it. Okay. So I had a second question. Uh, do, do, do you plan any sort of template specialization type features or? No. Those are and gonna we be are avoided. Yeah. yeah, we are explicitly avoiding any kind of specialization mechanism where you can have templates with the same name or something like that, and it picks which one. No, we're not doing any of that. We've uh, we we spent a fair amount of time looking at other languages, and uh, we've got a language design expert on the subcommittee who who advised us that we don't want to go down that road. Can can you give any insight into the thinking there? Just that it's unmaintainable or yeah, so one, it's hard to maintain. Two, you end up with lots of ambiguities, and then you end up with terrible error messages, right? So the, one of the big design goals here is like we want to give good error messages on both sides, template writers and template users. And so that's an aspect uh, that you're just going to end up with, you know, somebody's going to uh, try and instantiate a template and specialization is either going to end up being ambiguous in that case or it's going to end up trying to instantiate a version that it did that some, that person didn't expect and they're going to get a weird error from that instant like we, we don't want to try and hide any of the magic behind the scenes we want to make sure that it, it's it's all kind of explicit so everybody knows what's going on the template writer, the template user, and the compiler all have enough information to very, give good error messages. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Did you, did you mention L4 trend, Brad? I was about to. So uh, if you want to try some of these features out, the L Fortran compiler already has a prototype that you can go take a look at. So at dev.lfortran.org, uh, you can even grab one of the examples. Uh, there's an interesting example about doing uh, kind of unit safe operations. Uh, so the basic idea is a, uh, a calculator for average speed or average time uh, for some travel, right? Uh, and so it shows the way that you can kind of get units safe oper operations inside the template with like zero overhead. But, but anyway, so it's making use of template requires requirement, et cetera. 
and you can go ahead and click the run button and it's actually instantiating two different templates and then calling the appropriate procedures and so this this uh the prototype is the compiler is in WebAssembly and it compiles the Fortran code to WebAssembly and it supports templates. And so all of this happens locally in the browser, which is really cool. Does the compiler have error messages? It does. So, so yeah, I, can you I break just... it and, and yeah. Oh, uh, they took the, a lot of inspiration for how they're doing error messages from Rust, which is notoriously good at error messages. And so, so, so this one's a semantic error. So I, I changed, the, uh, changed the spelling of that module. And now it tells me uh, template travel M not declared in the current source and the module file was not found. And so it's, it's giving that error on the use statement. But what about if you, uh, instead of adding add real, you add, a, you put in something like, um, right. uh, you know, so like in this, instead of a binary operator. <laughs> right. So like here, right. So it says plus D of D1 and D2. If I inadvertently tried to use the plus operator, which is not available inside of this template, right? D1 and D2 are of type T, not something that plus knows about. So if I try and compile that, oh, that should, that absolutely should fail. Uh, so they're not giving good error. They're not catching that error, although it should be. All right, right. So it like, this is still prototype. Like, yeah, we haven't even, fin we haven't even finalized what it's gonna look like in the standard, but that should be giving you a decent error messages. Which standard version is it aiming for? Which, um... 20, right? So there's going to be a revision of the standard coming out this year. And so this is targeting the next revision. And there's nothing, there's no fixed schedule for when revisions of the Fortran standard come out, but they've been averaging about every five years. So roughly 2028 is probably when this will be ready. Okay. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm gonna have to jump to another call shortly, but I wanted to echo that comment that this is really cool, not just the feature, but the fact that you can use it already. And I, those of us who've been around Fortran for a while, there's a lot of mm -hmm. community-wide PTSD, I think, around <laughs> compilers <laughs> lagging the standards by several years or more. Yeah. And um, to see a compiler that's already supporting, you know, at least a prototype of the features even before they're in the standard, like years before they're in the standard is really exciting. Yep. Okay. So next on the agenda was having a discussion about uh, some sort of training seminar, training class, something like that in near-ish future timeframe. Um, so my thought was July is wide open for me, but I want to get a, some feedback about what what kind of time frame works well for you guys. What what would be good length for the training session? What would be good for the topic? And then would you guys would there be interest in doing in person or hybrid? Or should we do a virtual one? Um, what kind of thoughts do you all have? Also, let me just mention there is a related training happening already at Oak Ridge. I'll put a link to it in uh, the chat. It's in July, so probably just want to avoid. Um, oh. I say related because it's it's covering three PGAS languages, so Fortran, Chapel, and right. EPC++. I'll put a mm -hmm. link to that in the chat. Perfect. Yeah, that didn't make it onto my calendar yet, so. Yeah, it just got, I think, formally announced on the web, like yesterday or today, I think today. Yeah. Okay. 
So first of all, what would anybody be interested in terms of like topics? Would it be Fortran for beginners? Are you looking for advanced features like something focused on color arrays or object oriented programming or you know what we could do a hackathon let's let's try and you know somebody bring bring your own code and let's try and get it to run on a gpu like there there's a handful of different avenues we could take so i just want to get a feel for what would what would be the interest from the community if i can start very briefly, okay. for us, it would be very interesting to have topic about best practices for Fortran programming with two objectives. Okay. First, TPU programming, so that we can collect best practices rules that we can later think in automating. And okay. second, in general, quality. So how can we help users, no matter performance, write high quality code so that when they compile it with different environments or different compilers, we can minimize the issues they find changing from one compiler yeah. to another. And this aligns with what we, uh, Damian mentioned the, in the first call about high quality, looking to current uh, Fortran and to looking forward to writing good quality code with the concurrent or any other things that maybe not well supported mm -hmm. in compilers, but should be coming in the upcoming years. So for us, that could be a great topic to, to discuss. Okay, so more of like a supported subset versus what do you what do you expect compilers to be supporting and what would be good for performance in in the future kind of idea yeah performance okay. and also quality in general so that we can right. help to so, produce high quality code that when they want to go to multi-threading vectorization gpu offloading or whatever mm -hmm. we see uh, when, we, when you open a code that looks good you really recognize okay this is high quality code when you see a code mm -hmm. that is not well written, you say, oh, wow, what is this? So what are the challenges? <laughs> How can you help, help uh -huh. them to go from bad code to good code, <clears> guided <throat> by a kind of I, tool? Or I, I have seen uh, code quality, like a metric for code quality as uh, WTFs per minute. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, like I open code and I go, what is this doing? Wait, why? Yeah. <laughs> right. The, the more frequently you say, I don't, uh, what? When you're trying to read some some code, yeah, that's clearly less quality code, but, you know, uh, yeah, we can definitely do recommendations for what would be high quality in terms of what, what do we, f what do we find easier to understand when, when somebody brings us code. So trying to sort of synth synthesize some of those ideas and in looking at the results of the uh, survey that was sent out to everybody about people's potential interest in this group in the fun group and what they would want to do. Um, I'm seeing a lot of answers there and sort of tied into what we just heard, um, maybe a discussion about like best practices in Fortran, specifically potentially focusing on making sure to include modern Fortran features, since a lot of people reported wanting to learn more about those modern features. And then mm -hmm. also people often mentioned um, wanting advice for porting legacy code to modern Fortran. And so potentially in sort of examining and teaching what best practices are in modern Fortran, maybe giving some hints as to um, how certain things could map from legacy code features that are frequently used onto modern features. So I don't know if that sort of sounds like um, along the path that people were thinking might be interesting. I, me, I like definitely. that Kate's yeah. proposals. Um, so I think people in this group right now are more advanced Fortran users, but I would like to advocate for uh, general users as there's the large pool of our general users wanting to learn object orient and um, Fortran and like the legacy Fortran converting to is, is definitely a good topic too. Mm -hmm. like maybe we could have a, a Fortran training series starting from beginner Fortran now to object orient Fortran now to portability mm -hmm. performance <laughs> GPU. Yeah, my, my plan is That's to do great. a series of these every I don't know, three, four or five months or something like this. And, you know, try and rotate topics around and try and make sure that we're getting getting a broad range of from beginner to very advanced and in between and, you know, the, the kinds of topics that people are going to find interested in. Because we can't fit everything in one training session. Obviously. That's good too. You don't have to like have to absolutely order them, yeah. you know, so that topic that of interest. Right. Was this yeah. fun we just proposed and and 
Um, another thing I want to mention is I think at this point we like virtual or mm -hmm. definitely not fully in person because we want to attract more users. We're opening user trainings to other labs. And when we do virtual, we, we get a lot more attendance. Yeah, uh, I would definitely be in favor of doing at least hybrid, right? That right, way. Right. Plus, we can record and keep keep those available for you know offline training. Yeah, we always record every uh, training at NERSC, and we also yeah. publish them at NERSC uh, YouTube channel. Yep. I just wanted to mention, in terms of um, presenting best practices, and I don't know if we have this already from survey data that you know Kate has distributed, but it will be very helpful Hi, to know. This is guy. I don't know what that was. It would be very helpful to know uh, what compilers matter most to people. Uh, so I made a decision right around the year 2018 to just go all in on writing Fortran 2018 and just abandon the compilers that didn't support me because there was a, I, I had spent many years trying to write to the lowest common denominator of compilers and just finally got frustrated. So at that time, there were at least three compilers that did everything I wanted, and now there are four. But there are some commonly used compilers outside of that four. So if we know that people, it's really important for people to compile with a certain compiler, that might influence the things that would be discussed or presented. So which are those compilers? Okay. <laughs> I imagine somebody <laughs> might ask. But <laughs> um, <laughs> Cray, Intel, G4Tran and NAG from the numerical algorithms group. Those are the four. So the big, probably the most important one that's missing is NVIDIA. Um, most of what I wanna do with Fortran 2018 is not yet supported by NVIDIA. What's happening is that NVIDIA is going all in on contributing to Flang, the LLVM Flang compiler that Brad, Kate, and I work on. And there are several vendors, NVIDIA, ARM, AMD, who appear to have kind of intentionally, they're kind of intentionally in a holding pattern where you're not, we're not really seeing their compilers add features from the more recent standards. And I either they're saying it explicitly, or at least you can kind of read between the lines. It seems that what's happening is that they're waiting for Flang to reach feature parity with their commercial compilers. And then I think they're just gonna abandon their commercial compilers and start either building, you know, offerings uh, like a, a specialized forked branch of Flang with their commercial extensions um, or, or just contributing to Flang, I guess. So something like that. So anyway, NVIDIA, ARM, AMD, if those compilers are important to you, it'll really restrict the kinds of things that we could present or talk about. Mm -hmm. Intel, Cray, G, Fortran, and NAG are all very modern in their support. So as far as survey data, the we... Sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. <clears throat> I had exactly the, the opposite experience, especially, uh, <clears throat> you know, Summit and Permatter. Um, most of the thing I wanna do are supported by NVIDIA, of course, probably because they have NVIDIA GPUs and not the same with Cray. And some of the things are, are not even talking about advanced things, like standard open MP target. Um, I had a, yeah, I had a feeling you were gonna mention open MP. So that's gonna be one important question for the group too, for Brad to you know consider, I guess, is, mm -hmm. is, is fun going to be focused on the Fortran language? In which case, open maybe open MP, open MP wouldn't be part of the discussion, or is it going to be focused on sort of like broadly what Fortran users are doing with the language? I don't know. So for this group, we're trying to you know focus on NERSC users and whatever they're trying to do with Fortran at NERSC, right? So I know I know there's lots of people trying to use uh, Open MP and Open ACC, and there's a little bit of CUDA, um, and so yeah, we want to try and support whatever is going to make make your projects work well at NERSC. So yeah, we'll, we can cover OpenMP and OpenACC and a couple of things. Yes, for sure. 
And as far as survey data, that um, there was a question, what Fortran compilers do you regularly use, which was sent out in the NERSC fun user group uh, survey. And um, you could select multiple compilers. So it, it wasn't necessarily which the question wasn't worded in sort of what you were saying, Damien, as which compilers are absolutely necessary for my work. It was just which ones do you regularly use? And G4Tran was the um, number one response and iFort from Intel and then um, Cray and NVIDIA. Those were sort of the top four compilers. And there was another survey that um, I sent out for a different purpose that had a similar question in that. And so a different uh, survey response base and that was a similar um, response, those four compilers. So. All right, bye Damien. So, bye Damien. Um, yeah, so I think we have some good good ideas and uh, we'll start working on planning, uh, planning a, a training session uh, sometime soon. Uh, and I so, also, Sorry, Brad, yeah. I haven't mentioned this to you, but I just sort of thought of this during this discussion that I think we should probably send out something to the um, the email list because um, oh, yeah. there are mm -hmm. a lot more people in the email list than have attended today. So um, please look mm -hmm. out for something, maybe uh, probably just a survey asking about dates, I think is an important thing for us to figure out. And so mm -hmm. we'll sort of try to see what most people are interested in and can do date wise, and then we'll sort of go from there. So look out for that. And please, if you're not signed up to the um, to the fun user Google group, please sign up to that mm -hmm. so you can get this information as we mm -hmm. send it up. Yep. Thanks, Fred. Yeah, uh, so exactly what Kate said. And then uh, next we, next on the agenda, Manuel wanted to talk a little bit about Cody and the training session that they gave last week. Thank you, Brad. Um, can you see my, my screen? I can. Okay, I have not prepared any special slides. Uh, I thought it would be good to use the material we have created for the NERS course jointly with Helen, who is also has also joined us here today. So essentially, we can see what is the workflow we pre we propose to the users to start using Kodi and capabilities to benefit from porting GPU uh, code to GPUs using. C and Fortran OpenMP, OpenECC, and also uh, how to use Kodi to evaluate the quality of the code and also use quality checks reported by Kodi. So let me start. We, we use as a, a combination of codes written in C and Fortran. Let me focus on the Fortran ones. So let me use just for, because everybody knows about this, matrix matrix multiplication, okay? So here you can see a naive implementation of Matrix matrix multiplication that is following the typical AJK ordering, which is not good neither in C nor in Fortran. Okay, so the first thing uh, we suggest as part of the workflow using Kodi is use the Kodi screening report. What this means is that Kodi, you set up Kodi to analyze all the source code that you have in your project and then produce a report pinpointing which are the number of checks of the open catalog of best practices that we are maintaining at our website, but it is public and will always be public. And our vision is that will be at some point maintained by the by the community. So here you can see that for this matrix matrix multiplication, Kodi found 14 checks that are applicable to this code. Okay. And some of them cover a variety of memory issues, vectorization issues, or even offloading issues to the to a particular GPU. The second step when using Kodi is to follow one of the suggestions that is highlighted here in, in blue, that is producing the Kodi checks report. What this gives you is the listing of these 13 checks, what are they actually about, okay? So you get one line per check with a code that is a direct link to, other, to the open catalog located into the source file, uh, line number, and column number, regular notation that you get from compilers or any other source code analysis tool, and then one simple sentence that summarizes what the issue is about. So for instance, we have highlighted here that Kodi has detected a non-consecutive array access in the one of the loops. And also that uh, uh, detected a loop that is a good candidate to be offloaded to the GPU. Third step, we want to get as users more detail about of each of these uh, checks 
or a subset of the checks that are relevant for us. We provide capabilities to filter out and triage what is really relevant, but let me just continue with the simple workflow. Let's use the same dash dash checks uh, example, but now activating dash dash verbose. Could you give me the details you have about each of the checks? So here, for instance, for the non-consecutive memory accesses, it is pinpointing to the innermost loop that has a uh, row major accesses given the AJK order in the Fortran world that is column major. And also it gives you more details about the offloading opportunity. In particular, it also provides some commands that we call here autofix. Autofix is, uh, Kodi provides two types of capabilities. Static analysis, pure static analysis, scan the code and produce the list of checks. So you get insights about the code and you are pinpointed to parts, points of the code that should that deserve your attention. But for some of these checkers, Kodi also provides source code writing capabilities. We call it coding assistant capabilities. Why? Because in the end, it is about the developer to make the decision to use the writing capabilities, to ignore it, or just to write the code manually by, by themselves. But at least Kodi provides these capabilities to automatically rewrite the code. And in particular, as we are uh, aligned with the NERSC uh, users' needs, uh, we provide those code writing capabilities to annotate the Fortran code with OpenMP directives and OpenACC directives for vectorization, multi-threading, and offloading. So here we are highlighting the offloading ones. So the next step is that we propose is usually uh, the recommendation of experts is don't care about multi-threading, don't care about offloading, try to optimize your code sequentially. We call it here single code optimizations. And here we use as a representative example, loop interchange. Okay, so uh, here there are many differences between compilers. Here in the guide, we highlighted that, that MV Fortran, the NVIDIA Fortran compiler, is able to automatically interchange the loops of this uh, matrix metric multiplication. And this is one of the reasons why for this part type, type of code, uh, NVIDIA compiler outperforms, the, for instance, the G Fortran compiler. So what we want is to help Kodi to mimic this so that it, we can provide to the users the capability to detect loops that can be interchanged, provide the rewriting capabilities to rewrite the code, so that in the end, by using Kodi, they can understand when to apply loop interchange in this particular case, implement loop interchange in their code, so that the performance is not dependent on different capabilities from different compilers. And loop interchange is a very good example, only detected typically in Fortran for the more advanced compilers. So, for single core optimizations, you just need to change IJK for JKI in Fortran, okay? With only with this change, you are able to reduce the runtime from around 40 seconds to only 13 seconds. Single core optimizations. And look at the results between the sequential optimization by the NVIDIA compiler with the maximum optimization level dash fast and the implementation with the explicit loop interchange enforced in the code She's following the recommendations by Kodi. And you see that the, the performance numbers are the same. Later, we will see that in, for instance, with GFortran, we don't see this uh, performance level. Uh, so the first step is try to optimize your code for single core execution. Now, try to add to that optimized code offloading capabilities. And this is following the recommendation 55 of Kodi try to use Kodi to annotate the code with OpenMP or OpenACC directives. So you can just copy and paste these commands and here you can see the output where Kodi tells you what it has done. And also you can see below the code automatically annotated by Kodi. When I say automatically, it's not magic happening behind the scenes without the control of the programmer. Automatically the sense that the source code rewriting is done by the tool, always upon invocation of the user. Okay, of the developer. So with these optimizations for OpenMP and OpenACC, here you can see the code generated for the two standards using different sets of pragmas with one single invocation of two invocations of the PW directives tool. Then um, we can see that uh, following um, compiling this with NVIDIA compiler, the runtime goes for 40 seconds to 13 seconds with loop interchange with single core optimizations down to less than one second using the code with loop interchange and applying 
of loading capabilities on top of it. And here we see some variations between within the same compiler for supporting different standards. OpenACC performs really well. For OpenMP, the, the error, uh, the, we get a fatal error, okay? From the NVIDIA compiler using OpenMP offloading capabilities. Finally, in these guides that will be available publicly in the website, um, we have also tried to evaluate, do some additional remarks about D4TRAN and about MV Fortran. So we can see that MV Fortran is autom able to automatically apply loop interchange. And this is one of the, but it's not able to apply offloading. It's always something that the developer needs to specify through directives. So with MV Fortran, with G4, with G4 Fortran, the, the situation is completely different. You can look at MV Fortran, the, the report, optimization report uh, offered by the compiler is really easy to understand really easy to parse via tool like OD, so that we can even understand what the compiler is doing and provide the recommendations that what the compiler failed to do. But look at the output of the optimization report of t Fortran. Large and very, very difficult to follow. It's intended, essentially, we are compiler engineers at Kodi, so we understand many of the things that are output here but have to do with very deep internals into the intermediate representation of the compiler that on our peer is of very little use to a regular Fortran or, or C developer. But what is interesting is that by enforcing a loop interchange following code optimizations, you go using G Fortran and OFAST maximum optimization level from 40 seconds down to 12 seconds. So again, you can use Kodi as a complement to create code, here's what we say with high quality, well written for the language, for the target environment, so that in the end, if we do it well and we automate the, the appropriate best practices, we can alleviate the user from suffering such a huge difference between compilers, compiler versions, and in particular going to offloading with different programming standards that are extensions to the language. Okay, so this is a, the first uh, thing I would like to present before opening for Q&A, let me give you a more realistic example. And here I want to thank the developers of the Oris National Lab who gave us grant tax, uh, uh, access to these codes and allow us to share these insights with their codes. Here we're using Nucor, which is a benchmark that uh, this uh, development team from Oris National Lab uh, suggested to guide and help us to further develop the Kodi uh, tool. So essentially, very quickly, Nucor here is just a main with some usage of and declaration of modules and a main program that uses those modules and really based on some inputs from their command line, invokes some of the functions of the, of the module. Contract, contract simple, transpose, they have different ones. In the module definition, you can see that they are using what at least from our knowledge is we can consider it more than Fortran in the sense that we have objects, we have procedures, we have interfaces, and even in some parts of the code, we also have usages of associate uh, clause. So here, what you see is implementation of different of these functions, contract, transpose, and contract simple. We have selected this as one of the use cases for the training at, uh, at NERSC. So here again, we see a step-by-step -step guide to get it started, not for a, part, a small code, but for a code base, a big code base that can consist of tens or hundreds of files. In this particular case, it was very good because it was only four files, but it is representative of what the users should do in order to analyze a real Fortran code with Kodi. So again, the same workflow. Kodi screening report. Now it reports the checks found for each in each of the files. Uh, next, Kodi uh, checks report. Here we get the details of the ten checkers. But what is surprising is that here we don't get anything that is really good insight for the developer to increase the performance. Indeed, this is kind of noise that we need to uh, improve in Kodi because this should not be reported as a as a recommendation, okay? This should be, this is part of the standards uh, built-ins of, of Fortran. So what can we do to, to understand what's going on and why Kodi didn't offer any offloading opportunity? 
And here's the, the, one of the interesting things that this offers. Okay, one of the things that Kodi uses is Kodi internal is using the FLANG Fortran front end, not the compiler tool chains to produce binary code, only the front end to interpret the Fortran programming constructs. So from this perspective, Kodi can report that a can fail to analyze a file for two reasons. Something external to Kodi, FLANG still doesn't support a given programming construct. Or all the code is supported, but Kodi has some limitations, and we need to work internally on improving the capabilities for Fortran and raising them to the level of what we have in C. So here you can see an example of by invoking Kodi with the non-analyzable flag, here we get a clear identification of issues or Fortran codes not supported in the flag. Here is polymorphic data types or allocatable components in the right type assignment. Okay. So what this is helpful is to um, uh, okay. What this is interesting is that how do we how how can we provide to the users a workaround to the front end limitations? In reality, we need to we need to provide the compiler or the tool a source file that doesn't have these features. So what we did in the past for the C programming language is what we suggest for Fortran, and we hope this will be useful and the right way to go. Feedback will be welcome. What we support, what we provide is to we suggest it to use outlining. Outlining essentially is take the target function to a separate file that only has Fortran programming constructs supported by the front end. Or outline a given loop with all the inst statements inside it supported by the front end. Because that way we remove from the equation features not supported by the by the compiler. And we can get the insights about from Kodi. So here's what we did in the split versions of the code. Essentially, we took this function here, contract simple to a separate file. Once you do this, you can see that now Kodi. Uh, let me check. Okay, already re still reports eight checks, but we wonder if they are really useful. So we again we invoke Kodi with non-analyzable, and we get the listing of one feature that is work in progress in Kodi and not supported yet. That is the support for the share deferred shape arrays in parameters of procedures and functions in Fortran, because this is not something we have in C, it is something specific for Fortran that we are already developing. But again, what we know now is that this is a limitation of Kodi. So getting this feedback from the community can help us to change the priorities in our roadmap, to really prioritize this development in contrast to other features that may be not accessible to Kodi, sorry, to Fortran users, because we still need to solve these things. Once you do this, again, you can fix the first shape arrays by using this explicit shape arrays. I don't know exactly how you call it in Fortran. My apologies for that. But once you have these supported data types, then again, the same screening now provides nine checks. The checks report now unlocks offloading capabilities, offloading opportunities for the user. And from this, you can use Kodi to annotate the code with GPU, OpenMP, or OpenSCC offloading pragmas. Okay, so this is something that we used two, three years ago for C because we, need, we didn't have still the mature support that we needed. Now we have it, we don't need outlining in C. So we foresee that within one year, we will probably do not need this unless we have limitations in the FLANG for front end, which can only be overcome by further developing FLANG or implementing this kind of workarounds so that Kodi can provide all the insights for the, for the user. And I finish with, at the last two seconds, we also use Tornado, large code with almost 120 files from the Oris National Lab. We pass through Tornado Kodi and we get a screening of 800 checks, applicable potential things that Kodi identifies as something the developer should need, should, should at least be aware of. But this is one important thing. The other important thing is unsupported features. And Kodi provides through the non-analyzable a ranking of how many times a given unsupported feature appears in the actual code base. So here what we see, for instance, is that in Tornado, there are 200, 2,800 points in the program that are using range-based 
access. This is essentially the array notation in Fortran. Again, something that doesn't exist in C. Also usage of the associate expression in 200 points of the program. Are the fair shape arrays in 97 functions. So we, if we are able to um, encourage the users to use Codi, pass it and get a screening report to see what is relevant, what is not, and help us to prioritize this for the best practice recommendations. And second, provide us with the output of the non-analyzable to get the insights about what are the real FLANG constructs, real Fortran constructs not supported by FLANG, so that we can feed it into the FLANG development. And also, what are the features that Kodi doesn't support so that we can feed it to our development team? We believe we can create a good circle to get the feedback, real actionable feedback from the community to really improve Kodi, improve FLANG, and save the community from day one. And this is our vision. So it was really helpful to do all of this work, two, three weeks to prepare these materials. Tornado is not available because it's very large for a training, but I think it's a very realistic and very good example of the kind of insights and how we can use Kodi to serve the community and the scope of this group. And this is what I wanted to present. I think I went a bit probably over time, but I hope Thanks, it was Manuel. interesting. Yeah, that was good. Uh, we're a little over time, so I think we'll have to defer questions for uh, maybe contact Manuel directly if you have questions. Um, but uh, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.